Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this new Guessy webinar series. So to remind you, the Guessy webinar series serves as a platform for the Guessy Network members to share experience and expertise and evidence syntheses and to learn about potential collaborations. Before we start, let us go through the details of GoToWebinar in case this is your first time. Okay, so if you have any questions or if you would like to participate in the discussion, please use the toolbar on your right to submit your question in the questions toolbar. And feel free to use the raise your button hand, uh, raise your hand button um, if you'd like to make a comment directly. Um, so to start with introducing the webinar series, the stakeholder engagement webinar series uh, will begin today for at least six months and we'll be hosting one uh, session per month. If you have any uh, contribution that you would like to make, please feel free to contact us so that we see how you can add your input to the sessions. Stakeholder engagement is an integral part of all systematic reviews to some degree. However, there has been a little discussion of this important process and systematic review guidance to date particularly in the field of environmental management and conservation. The series discusses various aspects of engaging with stakeholders, describing the ranges of methods available, outlining experiences from various systematic review experts, and discussing issues relating to conflict, the benefits of training, engaging directly with decision makers, and communicating review results. For this first session, I'm happy to have Dr. Neil Hadway with us to talk about the, a framework for stakeholder engagement during systematic reviews and maps in environmental management. Neil works at the Stockholm Environmental Institute, SEI, in Stockholm, as a research fellow specializing in evidence synthesis. He also leads the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, CEE Center, at SEI. Neil's review work focuses on environmental management and international development. More specifically, he has worked on reviews in conservation science, human well-being, climate change, and greenhouse gas emissions, forestry, energy transitions, pollution, and multidimensional poverty. Neil is very active in, publication, in publishing methodological guidance related to systematic review methods and is involved in a number of working groups with CEE. He has over seven years experience of working with evidence synthesis and delivering training in review methods, and he is endorsed by CEE as a systematic review trainer. It's an honor for us for having you with us today, Neil. Thanks very much, Tamara. Sorry, I was just on mute there. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yes, great, thank you. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Thanks very much for that um, introduction, Tamara. Um, it's really an honor to be here and talking to you today about uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, like I said, uh, like Tamara said, this is um, the beginning of a series of uh, webinars about stakeholder engagement. Um, particularly in environmental uh, evidence synthesis, but really relevant to, to any sector. Um, there's some really in, uh, interesting presentations that will be coming up, so please do um, stick around and see what will be coming up over the next uh, six months or so. Um, as Tamara said, I'm a research fellow at uh, SEI, um, based in Stockholm in Sweden. I'm also a research associate at the Africa Center for Evidence at the University of Johannesburg, uh, and I lead the SEI CE Center. Uh, at um, SEI. Uh, okay. So um, this series really came about from um, a discussion that we had within the um, Collaboration for Environmental Evidence Stakeholder Engagement Methods Group, where um, we identified a real need for advice and guidance in how to conduct and report stakeholder engagement within CE systematic reviews, but more broadly, um, across systematic reviews more generally. Um, and at the CE conference in 2016 in Sweden, we had a thematic session um, where a number of people presented on different aspects of stakeholder engagement. Um, and there we really uh, identified this need for more guidance and better reporting. Um, so some of the outputs of these discussions were uh, an ongoing special series in the journal Environmental Evidence on Stakeholder Engagement. Um, and this ongoing series has been turned into an open access book, uh, the first edition of which uh, was produced in April 2018, and it's available on the EVM website. There's a link at the end of this presentation. 
Um, and really importantly, a community of practice of people who are interested in stakeholder engagement, different aspects of the process and how we can integrate it into evidence synthesis. These are the titles of the papers in the uh, special series so far, um, ranging across the whole uh, process of systematic review production from question formulation, dealing with conflict, um, really thinking about what we mean by rigor and uh, uh, yeah, rigor in systematic reviews, um, thinking about training in systematic reviews as well and capacity building, um, approaches to prioritization of questions, um, lessons for introducing stakeholders to evidence synthesis, um, transdisciplinary working and how to um, think transdisciplinarily, if that's a word. Um, thinking inclusively about involving people in prioritizing a multitude of questions in a controversial field of regulatory science, specifically GMO, uh, genetically modified organisms. And then one of the most popular uh, papers of the series so far that's been spread really um, across a number of ranges of different disciplines is this paper on storytelling and rethinking about how we communicate to tell a story, not being afraid of, uh, of anecdotes when they're backed up by evidence. Um, and then a final um, paper that came after the uh, editorial that Sally Crow and I wrote, that's uh, talking specifically about engaging policymakers in systematic reviews with experience from DEFRA in the UK. So what we're going to be talking about um, today in this session is the first paper, it's a framework for stakeholder engagement that sets out a suite of different processes and methods that can be used in uh, systematic review to make the most of stakeholder engagement. Um, so here's the, um, the paper that you can read. What I'm going to be doing is just giving a, an overview really of the content of this paper. It's um, a very information dense paper. So if you do have any questions arising after this or you want to learn more, then please don't go and please do go and have a look at that. It's a, an extensive literature review and a, the results of a survey of um, systematic review practitioners, as you'll see as we go through. But it really aims to be a, um, a kind of go-to resource when you have questions about systematic reviews uh, and stakeholder engagement. So in this presentation, I'll be giving you a brief overview of what we mean by the term stakeholder uh, and why it's important to engage with stakeholders as well. I'll then talk about how you go about identifying and selecting stakeholders or how you might go about doing that. Um, and another process that really helps uh, stakeholder engagement, which is um, analysis and mapping of stakeholders. And then I'll talk about um, two important uh, concepts, achieving balance in stakeholder engagement and phasing engagement um, before talking about some of the challenges of stakeholder engagement and some concluding remarks. So to start off with, um, just thinking about defining uh, stakeholders, um, probably the, um, the most uh, common definition of stakeholders is from Freeman in 1984, which is any group or individual who's affected by or can affect the achievement of an organization's objectives. That's necessarily very broad um, to encompass anyone or anything who is involved or could be affected by um, an action. Um, and it, it's difficult perhaps to think about how that would be applied in the context of systematic reviews. So we conducted a survey of systematic review experts um, and the definitions that we came across were things like uh, people who are either affected by an issue or those who may be able to influence an issue, which includes local people, producers, NGOs and governments. Some people said that it was anyone with an interest in a particular issue or any uh, one likely to be affected by an issue or a decision, which includes poor people, researchers, research experts, um, particularly systematic review methodology experts. Uh, people that have an interest in the subject matter includes researchers and experts, those generating evidence and the end users of the evidence, also includes subjects of conservation and development projects. So this uh, group of people that we interviewed was from a range of different disciplines, from health, development uh, and environment. Uh, someone else thought it could be a personal representative of an organization that's affected by an activity that's being reviewed in one way or another, and they include scientists, those who have a stake in the question, policymakers, academics, educators, NGOs, someone who has a stake in the findings, the issue have real meaning in their lives, someone affected by the review findings. 
Uh, and those in one way or another that use the information from a systematic review, mainly those in decision making, for example, ministries, agencies on all levels, local, national, international, and include scientists. So you can see there's a really big range of different definitions there. They're all broadly talking about the same thing, but some have quite a narrow definition, um, specifically, for example, people in decision making. Some have a broader definition that also includes people who undertake a review. Um, but it's worth kind of unpacking that a little bit and thinking about why these definitions differ and why some people have a much broader definition than just the end user. Um, and in thinking about why a broad definition is useful, it, there are a number of uh, main uh, reasons. One is that systematic reviews are often um, published as public goods. Um, so we have the intent that they will be used widely and more widely than just the person who we perhaps were intending on doing the review for. So it's not often only the end user that might have asked for the review or we might really be targeting with the review. We make it more publicly available. So thinking more broadly about the definition of stakeholders helps us to anticipate the kind of people who might end up using it, even if they weren't our intended audience. Um, Another reason for having a broad definition is that we're then less likely to exclude marginalized groups. So um, if we have a broad definition and consider potentially anyone who's affected by the issue, then we might be less likely to uh, forget to identify or just miss someone who might be marginalized by an issue. It also means that we um, are likely to have better planning and more resilience in our review if we um, think more broadly and flag up potential issues that we might otherwise miss if we only look at one uh, specific end user. Um, it also helps to identify and mitigate, mitigate risk of unforeseen bias. For example, if there are conflicts of interest within the review team or the advisory group or the immediate group of uh, stakeholders who are being actively engaged, we can help to um, flag that up and try to mitigate it before it causes problems. Another reason is that actors can have multiple roles and perform multiple actions um, as a stakeholder. So you might have an individual representing an organization, but it's very difficult for them um, in a very heated discussion, perhaps, to only represent their organization. They might be representing themselves as well. So thinking broadly about both citizens and organizations or individuals and organizations can be important. And then finally, it's um, useful to have a broad definition because it helps us to think um, not so much just about who uh, the stakeholders are, but more about how the engagement works and what engagement they're going to be having, not just about the label that we give them. There are some cases when we might want to be careful about the term stakeholder. We might not want to call our stakeholders stakeholders. Um, and that's because, as you can see, stakeholder clearly hides a lot of detail. It lumps lots of groups together. Um, it also often disguises the need for tailored engagement that some stakeholders will need uh, engaging with in different ways. And if we just talk about stakeholder engagement all the time, we might be missing the need to engage with specific stakeholders at specific times and in specific ways. There are some cases where the term is also contentious. Um, one example is with the Sami uh, indigenous people living in Scandinavia who object to the term stakeholder. And that's because it's been used widely in a financial and rights perspective around land use and land ownership. And the Sami people reject the idea of land ownership. So they've been uh, excluded from discussions about stakeholders because they um, don't uh, identify themselves as land owners or believe in land ownership. Uh, it means that they've been left out. So in a project with Sami, for example, we would avoid the word um, stakeholder. Um, so then it might be better to talk about stakeholder more generally as a process, but then when it comes to how we're going to do that, be specific, who are we going to um, target, what's their role, what are they getting out of the review, what are they giving to the review, and being a lot more specific. Um, so thinking about why we engage with people, um, there are a number of reasons for why we engage uh, with stakeholders in systematic reviews. One more obvious one perhaps is that there's a moral obligation if we're dealing with public issues and public funds. We have a moral obligation to engage with people um, to ensure that they benefit from the project and have a say. It also has been shown that by engaging with stakeholders, research um, has, or researchers have more access to more knowledge. So um, they're able to get their hands on a, a much more diverse and comprehensive uh, 
body of knowledge than if they uh, just work in isolation. It also means that um, stakeholder engagement in a project is more likely to have public acceptance of a project output. It's also then more likely to be judged as being successful. And it also means that the projects uh, that have stakeholder engagement are more likely to have a broader uh, and more intensive and perhaps successful communication effort as well. Um, and then finally, as a knock-on effect, um, it's been shown that stakeholder engagement can have an increased impact on decision-making as well. So when we think about um, stakeholders, I said that we should, perhaps shouldn't think about who, but um, part of the process of, um, of thinking beyond just the who we're engaging with um, starts off by thinking about the who uh, to begin with, and that could be advocacy groups, it could be businesses, citizens, decision enforcers, decision makers, publishers, research funders and researchers, very broadly speaking, and those terms might be defined quite differently in your discipline. But then if we think about the kind of roles that they play, they might be editors or peer reviewers, they might endorse the review, they might hold access to evidence, they might fund evidence, they might publish evidence or syntheses, they might help to communicate research, they might ask questions, they might be reviewing research, they might help to influence the scope of projects, they might uh, provide a service, for example, um, uh, providing an intervention um, in the real world, as it were. They might use that service um, and they might use the review. And then beyond that, we can think about a range of different actions that those actors in those roles can have. And they could be suggesting sources of literature for the review. They could be submitting articles for the review. They could undertake the review themselves or perhaps endorse the review. They can facilitate access to the review. They could read the review themselves or perhaps read it and then share it. They could integrate the review findings into their decisions somehow. Uh, they could help to set the standards of uh, the review in terms of its methodological rigor. They could provide funding for the review or in-kind contributions. And they can share knowledge and experience for setting the scope and the context of the review. So if we think with this kind of conceptual model, um, it helps us to think about different people and how they engage with the review. So some examples could be a concerned citizen who uses a review on the impact of plastics on marine biota. Uh, and they integrate the review findings into a decision about whether or not to purchase plastic water bottles. You could also think about a research council that might fund a review onto, uh, into the efficacy of crayfish conservation in the UK, and they would provide money for the review and integrate the findings of evidence gaps into the funding of primary research. So it's worth thinking about um, stakeholders in, this is just one framework for um, thinking about them, but thinking about them in a, a broader way. Uh, and this is just a schematic of the ways in which stakeholders can engage with a review um, by providing something or by the review providing something to them. Um, and this schematic is provided in more detail in the, uh, or described in more detail in the um, framework paper. So there are a range of different benefits of engaging with stakeholders. Um, some other, um, for example, it facilitates transparency. By dealing with stakeholders, you need to be transparent about the processes that you're using. Uh, and one concept that one concept that we uh, use to describe this transparent approach is the glass box approach, as opposed to a black box approach. And by being very transparent about the methods that we use within the review, um, we're able to then engage with stakeholders in a way that we can describe our research and say the robust, robust methods that we're using. Um, and they can ask questions and verify what we're doing. Um, but we avoid any undue influence on the review's findings and the process that we use within the review. Another benefit is that you can help to predict controversies that might crop up around either the review's results or the review's methods. Um, this is what was not done um, by Sanchez Bio and uh, Wickhuis, I'm not sh quite sure how you pronounce that surname, but in a uh, review that was published earlier this year um, in Biological Conservation. And in that review, they had searched only for three search terms and only in one resource. Um, and they clearly missed a large body of literature and they had a very biased review question. And if uh, they had engaged with stakeholders at the beginning, those kind of issues would have uh, cropped up and they could have prepared answers and improved their methodology before starting their review. 
Uh, stakeholder engagement also helps to ensure that you're using broadly accepted definitions and you don't end up trying to talk about a concept using terms that people define and understand differently at the end. It also helps to ensure that the methods that you're using are very rigorous, particularly the search strategy. Um, that's particularly important if you're able to um, identify people who can uh, tell you additional terms that you might have missed, additional synonyms that might be used differently in different contexts. They can help to provide access to grey literature, both showing you sources of grey literature that you can search and also providing access to reports that you might otherwise not find. And they can also endorse and help to accept the review. This is particularly the case if they're involved from the start uh, and you have a kind of co-design approach that we'll talk about in a bit with the protocol because they'll feel a sense of ownership, hopefully, that they have been involved from the start. Uh, and this also helps to um, improve communication at the end. Stakeholders can be really useful in helping to tailor communications. You don't have to second guess the kind of information that decision makers or practitioners want. You can just ask them, which kind of output would you like? A one page fact sheet, a short video, a podcast? And they can help you to tailor that communication to be in the right format. Um, one additional thing is that they can help to document the impact of your review. So if you have stakeholders who you've engaged with and built a relationship with throughout the process of your review, um, it's then much easier to uh, document and demonstrate that your review has had an impact, whether it's just being in the back of someone's mind when they make a decision or whether it's actually um, being used to change that decision or um, spark off a new decision um, system. Um, and a final benefit is that by engaging people with an evidence synthesis process, you can build capacity for evidence informed decision making and build awareness around critical appraisal and uh, evidence synthesis approaches, uh, things like critical thinking. These are just some of the benefits as well. Um, there are a range of different modes of stakeholder engagement from the informing um, passive side of things on the left over to the empowering side of things on the right. Um, research that um, tends to only inform in its stakeholder engagement is typically research driven in terms of where the questions come from. Um, the engagement is passive, it can be selective, and it can be quite exclusive in terms of who it involves and how. Uh, and there's generally very um, limited or sometimes even no feeling of ownership of the research more broadly than the people who are involved in uh, coming up with the question. And then through consulting people, involving people, collaborating, and then empowerment moves over to a needs-driven approach uh, that's very active in terms of its engagement. It tries to be comprehensive and as inclusive as possible and have a feeling of shared ownership. Typically, systematic reviews, um, as far as they can go, would be in around the collaborate and the start of the empowerment. Um, and that's because the systematic review process, once it's started, um, really sticks as closely as possible to a predetermined protocol. Um, and the people who then conduct that research need to be experts, um, subject and methodology experts. So um, uh, co-conduct. Um, of a systematic review is not quite so common, but co-design by sitting people down and helping them to, or having them help you design the protocol um, is something that we would uh, often do within a systematic review. So one of the first processes that you'll want to do in a systematic review is to identify which stakeholders to um, involve and to select them um, to be involved in your project. There are a number of different methods that can be used for um, uh, identifying and selecting stakeholders. Uh, one of the most common is probably purpose of selection, and that's the use of known contacts, people who you're already aware of. One of the problems of this approach is that you can potentially end up with a biased subsample because you only uh, cherry pick people that you're already aware of, uh, and it risks ignoring minorities. One of the benefits of this approach, though, is that um, it's easier to uh, access and maintain an engagement with uh, people who you already know. It's also then easier to deal with stakeholders uh, who are a smaller group, which is more likely what you're going to end up with from purpose of selection. Another approach, um, which is uh, snowballing, is uh, the process by which you ask key stakeholders to make suggestions of other stakeholders. This can also end up with a potentially biased uh, subsample. 
and does also risk um, ignoring minorities. But the risk of this is reduced if you use multiple starting points, if you ask multiple key stakeholders to suggest others and spread out the network that way. The benefits here are that a known intermediary is more likely to end up with a response, a successful um, response from people that you invite. Um, and also, uh, by, as I said, by having multiple iterations or multiple starting points, you're reducing the likelihood of ignoring minorities. Another process of identifying stakeholders is by having an open call where you uh, publicize the need for stakeholder participation publicly. Um, this does risk missing people who don't have an access to the advertisements, and you need to think carefully about where you put it. Um, and you might end up with a potentially unmanageable large group of stakeholders um, who potentially misunderstand the aims of the engagement because the advert is made passively. You don't have the chance to chat to people about the involvement. Um, and you do also risk swamping minorities in the groups that you end up with because you could have a very large group of uh, very commonly represented people and minorities find it harder to then uh, have their say. But one of the benefits is that um, some biases like identification bias and networking bias are avoided. If you want to know more about these biases, they're listed and described in the paper. I won't go into too much detail about them. Um, but you do end up with a potentially wider diversity of stakeholders by having an open call. And then a final method is a systematic search, much like a systematic search for evidence in a systematic review, you systematically search for relevant stakeholders, for example, by doing a search on uh, Google or in a database of stakeholders. The uh, problems here is that you end up with a much larger volume of stakeholders to engage, and you either have to um, cut it down or uh, engage with a very large group. Um, or you risk missing people with little online presence. Um, the benefits are that it's less likely to be biased because it's systematic, but then that depends on the search thing you use, much like in a systematic review. Um, and it's also repeatable and has a justifiable methodology. Typically, you'd use a range of different methods depending on the resources that you have available. Um, once you have identified your stakeholders, it's really important and uh, useful to map them and to analyze them, to try and have a bit of an understanding about who they are, what they want, how they can engage, and the best way of engaging them. And stakeholder mapping is good because it helps to ensure a balance in the stakeholder groups, and we'll talk about this a bit later. Um, it helps to prioritize certain groups of stakeholders when you have limited resources in your review. It also helps to identify, flag up, and mitigate potential conflicts between stakeholders, uh, particularly if you're dealing with a highly contentious group. Um, it also helps you to tailor the contact of your, um, with your stakeholders so that you contact people in the right way rather than just inviting everybody to engage in one way. You try to understand the best ways of engaging with different people to ensure that how you engage is efficient. Um, and it also helps you to phase that contact. So depending on the utility and the benefits to and from each stakeholder, you can phase them um, to start engaging with a certain group of stakeholders perhaps, and then change the group of stakeholders depending on, on what you're trying to um, get out of them and the benefit from, for them from the review. There's typically two different approaches to this uh, stakeholder analysis or mapping approach. The most common approach is top-down approaches where uh, the review team or an expert team, perhaps the advisory group, will classify stakeholders based on their knowledge of them. Uh, that may be specific stakeholders or it may be just groups of stakeholders like journalists rather than specific, um, specific organizations or named people. Um, and you might want to just think carefully about how transparent this process needs to be. We um, try to be as transparent as possible in systematic reviews and the process should be the same in um, stakeholder engagement but we might not want to be very transparent about some of the discussions that we have about who we engage and when, um, if we think some of that information might be sensitive. The other approach is a bottom-up approach where stakeholders classify one another. This is useful where there's a subject that's highly um, contentious or where there's conflict um, between stakeholders, uh, stakeholders or where um, one of the key concerns in the project is its legitimacy. Um, but this kind of bottom-up approach is very resource intensive. You need to spend a lot of time actively engaging with um, a large group of your stakeholders. So thinking practically about how you might do this stakeholder analysis process, um, one of the most common ways of doing it is 
through uh, matrices. And um, the most common one is an inter interest influence matrix. But you could change this up if you've got some different um, axes that you're interested in. So to explain, you would classify um, each group of stakeholders according to two dimensions. One might be the level of interest, how interested are they in the project? Uh, and the other access might be access rather um, might be what influence um, do they have in supporting our goals? How influential can they be? So you could do this across other dimensions. For example, the amount of evidence that people could provide versus the level of effort needed to engage them, or the if you're thinking about communication, the um, potential level of influence on social media versus the cost of engaging with those people. And what you do is you then classify them across these two axes. So here we have the um, interest uh, power or interest influence matrix. Um, and you would classify them as low, medium, or high, perhaps, and move them around actively in a, um, uh, a sort of brainstorming action activity with your with your group um, and broadly speaking you can classify this into four groups where people are, have a low interest and a low power you might want to just monitor them they require minimum effort where people have a high level of interest but a low level of power or influence in helping your review or helping having impact then you might just want to keep them informed where people have a low level of interest but a high amount of power you might either want to just keep them satisfied or try to increase that influence in the review. And where people have a high interest and a high, flat, high power, you might want to manage them closely and have active engagement to make sure that they're well informed and uh, the review benefits from them as much as possible. You can find out about this process very easily um, called stakeholder mapping or stakeholder analysis. Uh, we go into detail um, in our paper, but you can also find more in uh, the paper at the bottom of the slide there. So now um, move on to talk about balance, phasing, and planning of the uh, stakeholder engagement process. Um, firstly, on balance, what we mean by balance in stakeholder engagement is the representation of all main interests, views, and opinions. What we don't mean is quantitative or proportional representation. So we're not trying to get an equal number of people from different groups or um, a proportional representation um, of different groups. Uh, in proportion to how many people there are working in those different groups across the stakeholders more generally. Um, and the process of trying to attain balance is so that we can allow all relevant groups and individuals to have their say, and also to empower marginalized groups. The thing is balance is quite difficult to detect. It's difficult to say that you have a balanced group. It's most evident when it's absent. So if you're in a group and um, there's a clear imbalance, you'll really feel it. Uh, and you need to think about how to address that, how to bring in marginalized groups or groups that aren't having their say. And it's worthwhile also just mentioning that um, we should consider social equity as well as conceptual or role balance. So as well as thinking about the different groups of stakeholders and roles that they have um, as individuals or groups, it's worth thinking uh, about aspects of social equity, uh, like gender and ethnic background. In terms of phasing stakeholder engagement, I've mentioned this a bit already, but um, it's going to be disadvantageous if we try to engage all stakeholders at every process um, throughout the systematic review, the process of conducting a systematic review. So what we've done in our paper is to identify the kinds of engagement ac actions that stakeholders can have in a review when they happen during the review and the direction of that action, whether it's benefiting the review or benefiting the stakeholders. And so you might want to think about this kind of framework to identify which of your stakeholders you want to engage at which stage. Um, you might have some that you engage all the way through the process, but you might have some that you only engage at the start or you only engage at the end. Being transparent about that phasing um, might be something you'd want to consider as well. Um, and one thing to consider is if you're trying to engage someone all the way through a review, you should consider carefully um, if they are a named individual that over a two-year systematic review project, that person might have changed roles. So you might want to build a relationship not only with the person, but also with the organization that you're interested in. When you're thinking about planning engagement, there are a number of things you need to think about um, because they'll affect who you have in your pool of stakeholders and how they engage with you and how successful that engagement is. 
One is you need to think about how to invite people. Are you going to have a closed call or an open call? Are you going to use email, letters, phone calls? Are you going to invite people in person or by having a public posting? How are you going to engage with them? Will you have group meetings? Will you have individual meetings? Will you contact them by telephone or by Skype or by email or send them a questionnaire that they will fill in? You might want to think about having different engagement for different actors, that's tailoring that contact, partly because the contact uh, is going to be more efficient and more successful. Perhaps the, the number of invitations that you get accepted will be uh, higher if you give people different ways to engage rather than only inviting them to come to a physical meeting. Um, there's aspects about um, access to uh, transport costs or having their time paid, um, but also issues around getting the same um, or two different groups of people in the same room if you've got a topic that's very conflicting. And then think about what you want to ask them. Are you asking them for support, for endorsements, for their comments and opinions or suggestions? Uh, and being clear about that so they know exactly what you're uh, asking. And as I said, it's already, or said already, it's useful to know at what point you want to engage with them through the review and think carefully about why you want to only engage with certain stakeholders at certain points. Might they want to be involved earlier? So giving people the option of phase contact rather than just deciding that for them is useful to consider as well. And then how you ask is also important. Thinking about the terminology and explanations that you use and trying to avoid fatigue. Systematic review methodology is a very complex um, concept to explain to someone. And perhaps if you're just talking about a research project, maybe you don't need to explain that to someone who you're only engaging with at the communication stage. Maybe you just talk about a research project. And maybe you think carefully about having supporting information that ex explains exactly what a systematic review is, um, but try to avoid bombarding people with complex terminology. And then, as I said before, it's really important to have clear objectives in terms of what you're asking them to do, rather than just inviting them to come along for a day to discuss something. What are they going to be doing? What are they getting out of it? What are you getting out of it? What are you going to be doing with the information they give you? How might they help to influence research and what benefit might that have for them? So there are a number of challenges with this approach. You can probably tell already that it's quite um, a complex and can be a very time consuming and laborious task. Um, but I just wanted to take some time now to think about some of the challenges. Um, firstly, it's very easy for bias to creep into the stakeholder engagement process. Uh, and you can end up with a biased stakeholder engagement. That doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a biased systematic review. Uh, and having a system in place that protects your systematic review from undue influence is important. You can do that, for example, by um, giving people the opportunity to comment but not necessarily taking all of their comments on board or having an advisory group agree whether stakeholder engagement comments come in to influence the methodology. Um, but just to talk briefly about some of the biases, you won't be able to read this table but um, it's provided in more detail in the stakeholder engagement framework paper. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of as an example. One is at the stakeholder selection phase and this is called identification bias. And the purpose is, uh, purposeful selection of stakeholders using personal or organizational knowledge or unsystematic searches might result in a biased or unbalanced group of stakeholders. And um, one of the ways to mitigate this is to use a combination of selection methods, as I described before. Another example is during ongoing engagement in the review that you have something called commitment bias, where stakeholders might not be able to commit to being involved along the whole systematic review process. And that causes stakeholders to drop out over time, which might leave you with an un, uh, unbalanced or biased group of stakeholders, despite trying to have maybe successfully having a balanced group at the start. One way to try to get around this is by phasing contact with certain stakeholders according to their likely involvement so that you don't get them dropping out before they're actually having a chance to do something. But you can find more about these uh, biases and the mitigation uh, measures to avoid them in the paper, as I said. So um, this is just a schematic that shows the main stages of a systematic review uh, from a recent project that aimed to look at the time requirement of systematic reviews. Um, and you can see that from that study, um, the planning time, which is the part that really has a stakeholder engagement um, for most people, uh, is a large proportion of the systematic review time, unsurprisingly. 
um, but also the kind of administration time dealing with people, um, developing the protocol, uh, dealing with stakeholders' suggestions and getting back to them, and also communicating the results of the review together take a huge proportion of time. Um, so it, you need to plan it carefully. You need to be efficient. You need to be smart when you're doing your stakeholder engagement. Um, but thinking about some more um, challenges as well, um, many people think that um, a good stakeholder engagement can divert resources away from the conduct of your review, and to a large extent that's true. Um, we all know that budgets for systematic reviews are typically quite small, um, and it would be easy for a stakeholder engagement process itself to uh, swallow almost an entire uh, systematic review budget. Um, you can build a stakeholder engagement process for uh, restricted budgets by just planning carefully and thinking about which are the most important aspects to get right. Um, as with a systematic review, planning from the start helps to avoid um, unforeseen problems. Um, it can also be difficult to maintain balance and representativeness, um, particularly if you're trying to engage everyone all the way through the process. Um, there's a need to manage stakeholder expectations as well, um, that they might be expecting to have uh, an impact on the review, uh, and you need to be clear that uh, certain kinds of impacts won't be possible, and shouldn't be possible. As I said, you want to avoid overwhelming them with jargon or too much information. Um, equally, you want to uh, avoid undue influence um, on your systematic review from your stakeholders. So being clear about the kinds of things that stakeholders can contribute to and the kinds of impacts that they can't in terms of the systematic review methodology and output is important. Um, in many cases, you might want to start off with a default of providing anonymity to your stakeholders if you do report your stakeholder activity, which we'd encourage you to do. Um, but then you should think about giving acknowledgement and that it's stakeholders who've given up their time to turn up to a stakeholder um, meeting might uh, really deserve to be acknowledged, but then um, considering their anonymity is important as well. So the balance between default anonymity, but um, asking if they would mind having their names provided in an acknowledgement might be an approach you want to take. Um, as always, there's a potential for stakeholder conflict. Um, Anneke Nilsson and uh, Rasmus Larsson from um, the Stockholm Environment Institute have written a paper on conflict, and Annika, I believe, will be presenting on conflict later in the series. Um, planning how you manage conflict um, within your stakeholders and between your stakeholder and your review is important, thinking about whether compromise might be possible and what that might look like. Um, and maintaining long-term interest in your stakeholders is important as well. Uh, you should also think about avoiding tokenism, so don't just do stakeholder engagement because you think it's important, do it because you think it will be good for your review and do it well. You might end up needing to either bring in a specific um, stakeholder engagement expert or training your team in stakeholder engagement because it can be quite a complex process, particularly if there is conflict, ma conflict management needed. And ideally, um, it's worthwhile trying to monitor and evaluate your stakeholder engagement activities to know particularly if you're going to institutionalize systematic reviews in the future, what can you do uh, to improve your stakeholder engagement? What did you do right? What didn't you do right? It's also for the benefit of the larger systematic review, or broader systematic review community as well, to learn what works and what doesn't in stakeholder engagement. And then just before we finish, some final considerations. Um, firstly, on communication. Um, that I'm sure you all know, systematic review publication doesn't mean communication. Once we've published our long systematic review, it doesn't mean that it's been uh, communicated to the right people. And that we need to take the key messages and links to the evidence for those key messages out of our review and send them uh, to our, the right stakeholders. And we need in that process to think about who are these messages for and what format is most likely to be effective in terms of communication. Um, and those key contacts that we have can help to tailor those communications and test them. Um, but communication is easier if the state, stakeholders are engaged throughout. So by thinking of communication as an integral part of stakeholder engagement and engaging stakeholders from the beginning, um, we're much more likely to have a higher success in our communication. It's much more likely to be impactful because stakeholders will feel a sense of ownership. And then some final considerations as well. Um, 
we should balance the need for transparency and stakeholder engagement in reporting what we've done with engaging with stakeholders, stakeholders with this need for sensitivity, and that relates to anonymity. Um, we should be aware of balance and power in the group who are identifying and analyzing stakeholders. So if we choose to go for a top-down approach in stakeholder um, identification and mapping, then we should be careful about a potential for um, bias or balance um, or imbalance or uh, an unpleasant power relationship going on there. We should also be reasonable and feasible about who we expect to engage. People are often being asked to engage in research projects, particularly indigenous groups. Um, and if we are all inviting them to get involved with all of our reviews, then we might be expecting a bit too much. But if we invite the CEO of an organization to take part, is he really going, or she really going to? Perhaps we should uh, consider someone who um, might have less power, but would be more likely to be engaged. Also, uh, this relates to the same point. Don't ask too much that many researchers are asking for input and we shouldn't ask we shouldn't all be asking um, the same people to be involved in a large number of reviews. And then finally, plan carefully, um, check out the resources that I've mentioned uh, and that we review in our paper and good luck. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Neil. This was a very informative session and very happy to have started the series with this one. So we're going to take questions now. Please either send us your question in the toolbar on the right or use the raise your hand button. So we have one question on whether the slides will be available for attendees. Whether the, sorry. Whether the slides will be available. Yes. Yeah, um, I'll be posting the presentation on the OS uh, Open Science Framework, um, but I'll also try to make it available through Getty. Great, thank you. So if we don't have any specific question at the moment, I see that we have Richard Morley here with us um, from the Cochrane Consumer Network. Um, Cochrane, uh, Richard, that would be nice to hear from you about your input um, on how this um, method for stakeholder engagement is, uh, how we can compare it to the consumer engagement within the Cochrane method or whether at least the approach to targeting stakeholders is similar, maybe? Um, hi, Tamara. Thank you very much for um, for inviting me to speak. And thank you, Neil, for a really interesting uh, presentation. I'm, I'm aware of your work and uh, admire it very much. Uh, so thanks uh, very much for that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Richard Morley, and I'm the Consumer Engagement Officer for Cochrane. And uh, so I work to support stakeholder involvement in uh, Cochrane's uh, systematic reviews. Um, well, a particular subset of stakeholders, which is uh, consumers, patients, carers, uh, service users, however you want to describe them. And um, I suppose I would, I would just, um, well, a, a couple, I can say something and then there's a question for Neil perhaps, where, um, which is uh, that if uh, people are interested in uh, stakeholder involvement in Cochrane reviews, uh, if uh, there's a website which is consumers.cochrane.org and there there's a lot of uh, information uh, to support people who want to involve uh, consumers. We have a terrific um, resource for, for uh, review authors, review author teams, which we've called Involving People and, uh, and that has um, a, a wide range of uh, frameworks and downloadable resources uh, to allow people uh, you know, uh, to give people support in involving consumers in their, in, in their work and also there are some papers um, which we've published um, which describe the way that we approached uh, the, the, this work and the, the whole thing was uh, part of something called the active project and involved uh, researchers and consumers and other other people involved in Cochrane um, to, to produce these resources 
so we're very pleased with those and i think they're they're practical and useful for people i think uh, so so that was my just very quick advert uh, uh neil i wonder if you have any thoughts about this we when we presented the active resources we presented a range of different ways in which um consumers in particular could be involved in uh research uh, in evidence synthesis but we didn't um we didn't draw any uh, conclusions about the best way to involve people um or the most effective ways and so on i wonder if you have any thoughts about that about what the evidence says about about you know yeah um there's a range of different ways to involve people but what's the best way because i have to say that's a question that authors and editors in cochrane often ask yeah you know we don't have a lot of time so what's the best way given the limited resources to involve people given that we have to do it thanks very much uh that's a really good question richard um i i i mean in terms of environment <laughs> Um, I know that there isn't enough evidence in terms of effectiveness of stakeholder engagement, um, and I'm not that familiar with the, the healthcare um, evidence. I know that you guys are leaps and bounds ahead of us in terms of um, uh, stakeholder engagement um, more broadly. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we try to also not to be about what's best. Um, for particularly that reason that I, we weren't aware of evidence that um, suggested which method was best and there are pitfalls with all of them. Um, but I, I, I'm simply not aware actually, I'm just not sure what um, what the evidence is in terms of best practices. I do know that there are a couple of efforts to do uh, systematic reviews of stakeholder engagement. Um, Alex, is it Alex Pollock, I think, did a systematic review, but that was more about reporting, um, at least the one I saw was. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's related to a, a body of work that that group's interested in. Um, but I, I know that monitoring and evaluation and stakeholder engagement is generally not done. So um, it, it just highlights the importance to, to try to track what works and what doesn't. Um, I imagine the body of evidence is quite slim, but I just don't know. I'm afraid that's a really good question. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, Alex. Um was one of the collaborators, well, the led actually the, the work on the active project. And so I was oh, privileged to work with yeah. Alex. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for your presentation, which was very interesting, very, very clear. Thank you. Ah, thanks. Yeah. Too <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richard, for joining us today. Um, so we have a couple of other questions. I don't know if you have. If we have time, one is: Could you speak a bit more on empowerment and motive stakeholder engagement, and why this may not be feasible in systematic reviews? Um, I think thinking about trying to empower marginalised groups in stakeholder engagement, or trying to avoid um, power imbalance, is a really tricky issue. I think one thing we should probably try not to do is try and fix power imbalance in a system when what we're trying to do is stakeholder engagement for a systematic review because we simply won't have the resources um, available and we shouldn't try and do something without the appropriate resources. Um, but I, I do think there are ways in which um, a what tries to be a very independent method um, as systematic review tries to take a back seat uh, in terms of political views and um, predetermined uh, ideas of what results might show i think systematic reviews are quite a useful tool for trying to demonstrate that um if there is an imbalance between particularly between research and uh, a certain group of stakeholders that systematic reviews are trying to address that balance in in terms of the level of independence and um the procedural objectivity that they they try to attain so i think by Systematic reviews can be a useful tool to try and reduce conflict between research and certain groups of stakeholders. But um, I think, uh, yeah, my, my main point would be um, avoid trying to fix power imbalance in a system um, only as part of a stakeholder engagement process. And then there's a question from um, Amina. Do we consider the systematic review team coordinating the review among the review stakeholders? Um, yes. Um, I think I, I really like the idea of this broad definition of stakeholders because um, 
conflicts of interest within the review team are um, particularly in uh, healthcare right now are a really hot topic. Um, and by thinking more broadly about stakeholders, we can try to be um, transparent and be uh, open about um, the kind of conflicts that arise. One conflict, for example, is that uh, systematic reviewers are trying to get a systematic review finished. Um, and if they run out of money or run out of time, the rigor of the systematic review process might be uh, challenged. And so by being clear about that, we can try to build in um, appropriate planning into our systematic review process. Um, that's kind of an obvious one, but there are other ones where we can try to look for conflict across all stakeholders and not think of ourselves when we do the review as being above or different to any other stakeholder. Um, and then, is it necessary to distinguish between patient, end users, consumers, and the public? Um, I think that just depends on if you think that they would engage in a different way, they would benefit from a different way or bring anything in a different way. Maybe you want to phase them um, differently. I, I think that depends on your topic, really. And then finally, is there a specific framework for categorizing systematic review stakeholders that you can recommend? Um, no, I don't think there is, because I think it's so discipline and subject specific that you probably want to do one yourself from scratch. But um, I don't think st stakeholder engagement in systematic reviews is very well reported across the board, but you might find a systematic review that does describe stakeholder engagement and they might have used a categorization framework that you uh, would like to use and think is useful. So um, that's probably not very useful, but um, yeah, I think we're getting better at this. And our, our idea with our um, special series was that we wanted to try to uh, get people to report stakeholder engagement. Um, in a more transparent way to help other people design stakeholder engagement. So that's all the questions, I think. Okay. So thank you so much, Neil. This was a wonderful session. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact Neil directly or you can send us an email and we can forward it. The recording for this webinar will be made available within one week for free on the GASI website. Thank you and join us on the next sessions, part of this webinar series. Bye-bye now.